Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I'm excited to be here today with Adrian Gordon. He is a music teacher, a composer, an author. We have so many things to talk about um, with the, the diversity that a lot of musicians approach their career with. I'm excited to talk to Adrian because he does so many things. And, you know, I'm always talking about income streams and um, it's all good, but like, how do we balance all of it? So we'll get into all of that in a minute. But first, I always like to have people tell their story so people know, you know, the background and the perspective where our guest is coming from. So Adrian, if you could just kind of give us an idea of like how you got into music and what made you um, move into teaching music and composing and all of that. Yeah, well, hello, everybody. I'm Adrian Gordon. And Brie, thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of what you do. Thanks. Uh, but yeah, my name is Adrian Gordon, and I am a composer, author. Um, I run a publishing company. I'm a teacher, conductor. So yeah, I do quite a few things. And I started music at a young age. Um, you know, just like most people, I started in elementary school. I was singing and um, doing piano, and I moved on to string instruments and playing the violin. And, um, you know, it just stuck with me. I ended up going to school for music at the University of Miami. And I ended up studying music business and entertainment industries um, because at the time I was in a band. Uh, we were in a, a acoustic R&B um, vocal group. And I, and I wanted to be able to protect us the best that I could with all the knowledge wrapped up in music business. So um, I did that and uh, we were together for a while and, um, after separating with the band, I ended up going into teaching and I figured that would be just kind of temporary, but it, you know, 19 years later, here, <laughs> here we are. um, it stuck, you know, there's something that's quite gratifying about, uh, seeing the light bulbs and in, in kids' minds go off. And from there I, um, went into composition and, and publishing and, um, you know, and the rest is history. Wow. I mean, I, I agree. Like when, when you grew up and, and were in the school program and got excited about the instruments, isn't it cool to be able to light that up in someone else? Yeah. You know, it was a big impact for me. It was something that kept me for one out of trouble. Um, and it was always something in my mind. I always had tunes and um, notes running through my brain. So it was kind of no, like a no brainer that I would end up uh, doing music. Mm. And did you kind of fall into teaching or did you make a conscious decision? I, I have a lot of people that I work with that sometimes are like, well, I'm going to do this until my, you know, indie music career takes off or whatever. Um, and, you know, and then there's the people that consciously decide I love teaching. Yeah, I would say teaching kind of found me because, like I said, I was in my acoustic r &B band called Unison and we were performing and. Uh, you know, at one point we even got to perform for Michael Jackson and we were like, oh, man, we're we're on our way. And, um, you know, it, things didn't end up, you know, going the way I thought they would. And teaching found me. I got a call from uh, one of the nice private schools down the road when I lived in Miami. And um, I went in thinking, oh, you know, I'll just I'll go in. I'll teach for a couple months, maybe a year, and then I'll find the next thing to do. Uh, but it stuck, you know, it stuck with me. And, you know, like I said, 19 years later, I'm doing um, string orchestra here in North Carolina. And I've done a bit of everything. So I've done general music. I've done uh, choir. I've done. I've been an assistant band director. Uh, but my specialty, I would say, is orchestra. That's cool. Now, I do have to ask, because we were talking at the very beginning about how I have Michael Jackson in the background here. And then you said you've met him. <laughs> so what was that like? That was a surreal experience. Uh, like I said, I was in that band at Unison back in the day. And um, 
I was doing a lot of songwriting. I was at the University of Miami. I had a, a record deal through their their uh, record company called Kane Records. Um, <clears throat> and I ended up writing a, a tune that won an award. It was the John Lennon Songwriting Scholarship. Award. Oh, that's a pretty that's a pretty big uh, competition. That's great. Yeah, I won second place in the country, so I was really excited about that. So <clears throat> we had a, a, a friend of ours who was staying in West Palm Beach and apparently this huge house Michael Jackson was staying at and she connected with him and our producer and uh, said, hey, you know, we've got these guys who can sing and they can songwrite and uh, would you be interested in hearing their music and considering one of their songs for your album? So it was crazy because we we had what two days to write the music record the music produce it and all that and all the all the bells and whistles including the song that had won um that national songwriting competition um so we did all of that in two days went up to west palm beach and uh and met him and his buddy chris tucker which is pretty cool and um presented three songs to him um, and, you know, spoiler alert, he did not pick any of the songs that um, that we presented, but it was a surreal experience. And, you know, it was funny. He went up, he went up to bed, he went upstairs and he was singing my song to himself as he was walking upstairs. And I thought that was like the highlight of, <laughs> of my musical career at that time. So that was a pretty cool experience. And then, um, yeah, from there, I went back to school and I was sitting in my music history class <laughs> thinking, oh, my gosh. I just met Michael Jackson the night before, and now I'm sitting in a music history class. Uh, what a contrast. So that was that experience back in 2003, actually. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. And did that experience and, and winning that competition, did that inspire you to go into composition more heavily? Yeah. Um, I think I always had it in me to just be creative and compose. Um, and actually that trip to New York where I accepted that award, I ended up writing music kind of down the line about that trip, which is now getting a lot of performance time. Um, one of the pieces is called High Rise. So a lot of students and, and uh, groups are playing that piece around the country, which I'm really excited about. But um, yeah, from there, I, I kind of pushed on. And um, once I started teaching strings, I I kind of had this childhood dream of writing a quartet. So I was like, you know what? I'm in the perfect position to do it. I have students who could play it. And that piece started to kind of blossom into a string orchestra piece. Um, and I put that in front of the students and they didn't know it was me. And I put other pieces in front of them not knowing it was me. And they liked it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to send it to publishing houses. And from there, I got rejection after rejection after rejection from the public publishing houses. Um, and I was just, I didn't understand how students who are the target audience are enjoying the music, yet people in the publishing houses were not. Um, and I thought what I was doing was particularly special. And I thought it was special like a leap year. So I said, you know what? I am no longer waiting for permission, permission granted. I'm not going to wait for unknown faces to allow me to be creative. My own publishing company called Leap Your Music. And from there, that was the channel for all my um, creative endeavors and, and all my um, book writing and um, all my compositions, all my publications. So that's how all of that came to be. I love that you, you know, you had this group of people that you could test it on first and know that people are going to like it. If they don't know that it's yours, they might go, ah, this is so boring or whatever. You know, they'll, they'll talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> Kids right. do not keep anything to themselves when they have an opinion. I remember having opinions about different songs I had to do in school. And I'm just like, oh, why are we doing this song? It's so boring or it's so, you know, I don't know, but I definitely did not keep it to myself. So that was really smart and brave, right? Cause you know, they're going to tell you what they think. Yeah. They have no filter, but they ended up liking it. And I, I liked it. And, uh, and that's what, what really mattered. I believed in what I was doing and, uh, and I just went for it. And that's kind of everybody's story. You just got to go for it, believe in what you're doing and, and follow through. Um, yeah, 
Definitely. And and so you didn't have the backing of these publishing companies. And, you know, anyone can start a publishing company, right? But how did you know, how did you figure out how to get your piece into the hands of more people than just your students? That was difficult. That was a long process. That was like, uh, you, you know, 14 years overnight. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I, I started just locally. I started with colleagues, seeing if they would be interested in playing some of my music. Um, and then I started going to uh, some of the uh, clinics, the state clinics, and seeing if I could get my music in some of the reading sessions, the new publication reading sessions, and then also on the uh, contest list. So every, you know, not every state, but most states have a prescribed music list that, you know, has educational value that they want students to perform from. So I kind of went on, an, on a journey and tried to figure out how to get some of my music on there. And I would say for the most part, it was the networking and really um, connecting with people and treating every connection that I had with importance. You know, nobody was, uh, you know, not important enough to talk to or to connect with or to call or email. Um, everybody that I came in contact with was important. And then I try to be respectful and, and basically come at my career from a place of service to everybody that I came in contact with. And um, from there, things started to grow. Um, Leap year music started to grow. Um, I started putting my website together and it wasn't definitely not perfect from the get go, but um, it started to come together. And, and now here we are uh, where I have several pieces, several publications. And then now I'm also working with um, uh, a publishing house called Alfred Music. And um, that's been a fantastic feeling to kind of be on the other side of things, not just doing it on my own, but having somebody else support me and, and put my music out there. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, how an independent artist goes through the, you know, that period where networking is so important and they need to be building up their own career. And then eventually maybe they can approach a record label or a record label will approach them or, you know, a publisher or whatever, um, if they're a songwriter. And so how, you know, how did you kind of make that leap? Did you go to Alfred Music or did they find you because you were making so many waves in the industry? Yeah, I think it was, um, it was kind of critical mass with all the connections that I was making um, through teaching, through bringing in clinicians and people know every, it's a small world. The music world is very small. It is, it is. And you know, the more you go to a lot of these trade shows and all these clinics, the more you're going to just network and, and realize how small uh, the industry is and how many people know each other. So just kind of word of mouth and uh, speaking to people that I connected with in the past and um, doing favors for them with nothing expected in return and um, recommendations and, you know, just things kind of came together. I, I can't really pinpoint one thing. It was just really that snowball effect of connecting with people year after year after year, and it just reached critical mass. And it, I was able to kind of use that to my advantage and, and, um, and get my stuff out there. Yeah. I mean, the snowball effect is real and the critical mass thing. And I can't tell you how many pieces of music that I've looked at for, especially for choirs and things that are, let's say offered music on them. So congratulations. That's, that's a great yeah. company to be associated with. Yeah. They're a great company. They have a lot of, a uh, lot of great music out there for, a band for orchestra. Uh, I'm excited to be working with them. Awesome. So you said also in your publishing company that you have published books. I know you have a new book called Note to Self. We definitely want to talk to that, talk about that. Have you published books previous to that? No, but I'm working on my second book. Oh my gosh, already. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I have no idea when that's going to be published. So, but for right now, I do have that one book out there called Note to Self. Um, and uh, yeah, that book I, I, that came out last year and it's supposed to be a contribution to the music education community um, to talk about some of the things that really don't get discussed in uh, universities. So, you know, they, they teach you how to enter a classroom, um, they teach you 
philo teaching philosophy, they teach you psychology, they teach you how to play your instrument, they might teach you how to conduct, but nobody talks about how do you interact with students uh, to win their trust? How do you interact with your administration? How do you interact with your faculty? Um, what do you do to build culture? All those things that really don't get talked about at the university level when you're studying how to become an educator. Uh, and I wanted to put that in a book format since I had done so many different things and make that my contribution uh, to education. That's cool. And I hope that gets picked up by universities because I know I took a class called music in the secondary schools and I didn't learn any of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the idea. It, it, it's, it's for pre-service teachers and it's also supposed to be for people who have been teaching a long time in the field, but have never made that jump. So maybe they've been teaching at one place for five, 10 years but they've never had to transition into a new environment, a new community. How do I do that? Because yeah, I've got all the pedagogy. I understand all that, but how do I make that shift as smooth as possible um, in my new environment? And that's what the book is supposed to help with. Yeah. I think it is really hard when you're a new teacher because you know, you're used to everybody knows you, they know your abilities, they, you know, you know them. And yeah, there's always new students every year, but you have this core that you're already, you know, tight knit with or whatever, you you understand each other. And then suddenly you go into a place where no one understands you and you don't understand any of them. So do you have right. any, any tips for, for that kind of thing? I mean, even whether that's like, going into a school or just, you know, starting a totally new studio of students? Like, how do you kind of make that transition? Um, I think particularly if you're going into a new classroom setting, one thing that comes to mind is to make incremental changes. Um, you can't rebuild a program or shape it the way that you want it to be overnight. So if the program has some established, um, kind of traditions and you are really against them, I would say move slowly and <laughs> kind of phase them out. Um, or if, the, you know, they're playing at whatever grade level you meet them at and you want them to be here, take your time. It'll happen, but you just got to have um, that vision and have a plan and have goals and include them in the, on how to, how to reach that. Um, so that would be the main thing, incremental changes um, and then I, I think one of the big things is just to give yourself grace. You know, we, as educators, you know, we can be really hard on ourselves and beat up on ourselves and say, you know, I want things to be perfect. I want things to be right the first time. And it's messy. You know, education is kind of messy because it's, it's not an exact science. You're dealing with human beings and you want what's best for them. Um, but give yourself grace. Don't beat yourself up because it's just going to take time to shape the program that you want to see. Um, I would say probably anywhere between three to five years until you see your, your mark and your stamp on that program. So give yourself grace. Don't be too hard on yourself. Make those incremental changes. And then the last thing I would say is your personal health is really important. Um, when you make those transitions, you don't realize how much energy you're burning, um, how much you're contributing to so many different people, and you're not really being replenished. Um, so take care of yourself. Make sure you're sleeping, making sure that you're eating well, taking breaks, taking walks. Um, these are all things that I learned the hard way. I didn't do those things in my transitions, and I kind of uh, paid for it, you know, and I and I felt that... Um, that life force kind of being drained out of me. So, you know, the idea was to write some of these things down and really offer help uh, for other people so they don't have to touch that hot stove. Yeah, especially like what you said about incremental changes, because there is a serious temptation to come in and be like, I need to show them that I'm, you know, I'm making changes, I'm putting my stamp on it, I'm, you know, I'm successful. And so, you know, coming in there and just suddenly changing everything that will backfire pretty sure because people yeah. don't do well with swift changes like that. No, they don't. And I think more than anything, they want to know that you care. Mm. So you have to want to meet them where they are and then show them that you care about them as people. 
and that music happens to be the vehicle to show them that you care and, and mm -hmm. build a uh, character within them and discipline and all those things that you want to see come about. But they have to know that you care about them and treat them like human beings and uh, laugh with them, talk with them. Um, you know, all the things that you would do with a regular human being, they want that too. And once that's established, they are more likely to follow you and, um, and, and see your vision and do what you're asking them to do. Yeah, definitely. So I also like that you talk about, you were mentioning a minute ago about personal health and, and work-life balance. And it can be hard to do as a teacher, especially if you don't have a family yet, right? Because you are able to pour all of yourself into them and you can kind of get swallowed up in it. I know that I had a teacher that was like that. She didn't have kids and she, that was like her life. Right. right. And, and my daughter's choir teacher, I've heard her say many times now, um, you know, I'm really working on work-life balance. I have not been good at it in the past and it hasn't been good for me. And she's constantly, she says it out loud. She reminds herself and says it in front of the parents. So they know, you know, that if she doesn't get back to you in one day, uh, that's because she's trying to make sure that she takes care of herself, you know, and not just being right. swallowed up by the job. So I'd love to hear some tips from you about how you keep that balance, especially while you're also composing and writing and all these things. Yeah, I always say there's no uh, award for the most burned out teacher or <laughs> educator. Um, and I always think I kind of liken it to when you're on the airplane and, you know, the flight attendant comes on and says, hey, if uh, the oxygen mask drops, make sure you put yours on before you help anybody else. Um, and it may seem selfish at the time, but, you know, you really can't be good for anybody else if you're not taking care of yourself. So, um you know, one of the things I do is I put my family first. That, that has to come first, uh, my wife and my kids. Um, and then beyond that, I make sure to have my lists of things that need to get done. Um, and I try and protect my time. If I can't get to it, I like you, your, uh, your colleague or your friend was saying, maybe a day or so, it'll get done, but maybe not immediately. And I don't freak out about it. It's okay. Um, so I have my to-do list and I, I put my family first. Um, and then I have a goal board in my office so I can see exactly what needs to happen, when it needs to happen. And it's not all kind of floating around in my head. Uh, so I have my daily to-do list, but I have my overall goals that need to happen over the next couple of months and year or, or year. Um, and how am I gonna attack those goals? So, it's kind of strategic um, and it's not always neat. It's not always perfect. Um, and I'm not always going to get it right, but I, I definitely try and make sure that I put my family first um, because everything else will fall into place as long as you have uh, your health and you're taking care of your family. Yeah. You mentioned your health and, and taking walks and things. Do you try to build that into your day? Yeah, what I, I mean, one of the things I used to do was take a walk just to get that fresh air, get that vitamin D. And then I would also sit in my car. Sometimes, you know, having your home away from home, um, it's a you know, secluded area. You can put on the music that you, that you like. You can, um, you know, put on your, your AC and you're just relaxed. You can throw back your seat. And if it's just 10 minutes that you do that, and then you go right back into your your space, your workspace, and hey, that works for you. And that's just a mental break, a refresher uh, to help you get through the rest of your day. But yeah, I, I would do things like that. Take a walk. I would go sit in my car, um, use the restroom, which is something that I, you know, as teachers, you end up working so hard. Do you think, oh, I don't have time to use the bathroom? can't do that. Wow. I, I kid you not, you know, as, as educators, you got a ton of kids in the room. You want to make sure everything is good to go. Um, and you put yourself last and you really can't do that. So, so using the restroom, otherwise you're going to end up. So yeah, those, those are a couple of things that I would do to kind of take care of myself. And I also bring healthy snacks uh, to make sure that I'm not just loading up on junk food during the day. Um, I'm really trying my best to take care of my body. And this doesn't mean that I get things perfect all the time, but these are my intentions. And then I, I really 
strive to achieve these things on a weekly uh, basis. Right. And I think that the, the, the main thing is that you're being intentional about it in advance. Cause a lot of times right. if, you know, we're just going with the flow, like it's so easy just to let things happen to us instead of making sure that we've got all the things in place to be able to do it the way we want to do it. Yeah. I want to, I want to be proactive and not reactive with the understanding that things are going to come up. You know, I've got to be flexible. I'm going to get emails from every which way. Like right now I'm getting emails from every where you can think of asking me for this and needing music for that. And, but Hey, you know, uh, things, things are going to happen like that. And I, as long as I'm intentional about what I'm doing, like I know I have a ton of things to do tonight, but I know I'm going to go for a walk for at least 30 minutes today for me, you know, just to clear my mind and to get my heart rate up a little bit and to help myself. Yeah, I do think. And when, when you do that, when you get to the emails, you'll probably do them twice as fast because you won't be as, you know, tapped out. At least yeah. that's my experience. Yeah, I think so. So I'm going to ask this because you do work in the schools and I'm now experiencing this. I'm actually the treasurer for my daughter's choir, which is a new thing for me. And I am finding, wow, there's a lot of work to be done, like on the fundraising side and teachers really have to spearhead that. Um, luckily we have a good group of parents. How much of what you do is about that? Like making sure that there's enough money to run the programs that you want to run, buy the music that you want to buy. I mean, I'm finding they don't even support enough to buy all the music that's needed to do the pieces we want to do in the year. Yeah, luckily I'm at a, a private school that mm. fully funds our program, but I have seen that where it's really hard to fund the program and they'll do things like um, gift wrapping sales and they'll do things like um, uh, donut sales or, or cookie sales or, you know, bake sales and stuff like that. Uh, and I also see a lot of directors sharing music um, if they can't afford to purchase it. Hey, I'll, I'll, trade and, you know, give it back to me and, and, and things like that, where uh, they want to give the kids the opportunity to play that music, but they can't afford it from their program. Um, there's just, there's, it's hard. It's really hard. And I'm grateful that I don't have to do that right now. Yeah, uh, you are no. lucky. You are lucky, but I love what you said. It comes back to networking, right? Getting, I know there's, yeah. you know, there's groups in every state, uh, and probably even locally as well of like music teachers. Um, like you said, it's a small world. So just yeah. pooling our resources. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you really want what's best for these kids. And it's just, it, it gets harder and harder. And, um, you know, you, you want to do right by them. You want to see those light bulbs go off. Um, and you do what you can to make the program work. Yeah, definitely. Well, it sounds like you have a really great situation, which is awesome. And it's allowing you the ability to do these other things, which is allowing you to, you know, touch other programs with your music and that ripple effect. So that is awesome. Um, can you let our listeners know how they can find your book? Yeah, the best way to find it would be to go to adriangordonmusic.com. And once you go there, you'll see the link to my book straight up, straight away. So. Awesome. And is, is there the ability to listen to any of the, your compositions online anywhere? Yeah. All of them are on adriangordonmusic.com as well. Perfect. That's great. Well, do you have any parting words that you want to say to music educators or musicians that are trying to do all the things? Keep working hard, give yourself grace. Um, and like my dad says, keep adding fuel to that fire and it will grow. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Adrian, for all of your insight today. Thank you, Brie. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. 
and inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.